So I think most of you have seen me before. My name is Michael Upton. I'm a graduate of the class of 1994, um, psychiatrist student health center, and uh, one of the faculty members and uh, staff of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. I want to welcome everybody. Good evening. Uh, this is the fifth annual uh, Vito and Bassiani, MD, class of 1985, and George DiSalvo Di LGBTQ Health Equity Lecture. Dr. Bassiani and his spouse, George, generously funded this series with the goal of supporting the preparation of culturally competent physicians who can provide mental, or sorry, medical care and prevention services that are specific to LGBTQ health populations, an area that had long needed attention. Today, we're going to hear from Dr. Rachel Inker, who has been a family physician at the Community Health Centers of Burlington since 2001. Dr. Inker is a graduate of Harvard College, and at the age of 30, she entered medical school in her home state of Massachusetts and graduated in 1998 from the University of Massachusetts in Worcester and then completed the UVM Family Medicine Residency Program. Today, Dr. Inker is the lead provider at CHCB's Transgender Health Clinic, where she has provided care for transgender men and women for over a decade. She continues to practice the full spectrum of family medicine at CHCB's Riverside Avenue location. And a quote from Dr. Inker is, the most remarkable and most joyful part of my practice is to see people evolving and transforming to become the people they want to be. That's why I do it. And I think it's great that um, first and second year students can, can be here tonight. I, I know from some of you uh, first years are already starting to get worn down. Um, and second years are um, maybe starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel um, to your clinical years. But I know that a lot of you, before you got here, were hoping that as one person, you could, could become physicians who could make a difference. And is somebody who's been a, not only a member of the LGBT community in this community for a long time and at the UVM community for a long time, um, and at, at the University of Vermont Student Health Centers since 2004, Dr. Inker has been one person making a difference for Burlington and Vermont and the UVM community. So when I started here, UVM was a five-star LGBTQ school, and students here who were transgender couldn't get their um, hormones or assessed for things like that or get their care at the student health center. Um, they couldn't get competent care for primary care. They um, experienced things that were devaluing and um, uncomfortable, they would come and tell me in my office over in CAPS about those experiences. And over and over and over again, where they would find their way was to the community uh, health center where they would see Dr. Rinker, they'd end up there for primary care. And I would hear it at the Pride Center and just in the community and in the people I knew. And so for a long time, one person in one clinic has been making a difference for a lot of people in this community. So help me welcome Dr. Rachel Inker. Let's see if this, is oh, yes, it's on, okay. So in 2004, a trans educator came to the Community Health Centers of Burlington, where I work. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? Pretty up, up. Is that a, hang on. How about that? Better? Much better. Thank you for the thumbs up. OK. And this educator came to the health center. And at that moment, I knew literally absolutely nothing about transgender people, about gender transition, nothing. It had not been at all a part of my training at medical school in the 90s. It wasn't part of any training at my UVM family practice residency. And this man, about my age, stood in front of our, our group talking, and his first slide was that of a pretty adorable, maybe five-year-old girl wearing a white lacy dress. And he pointed to the screen and he said, that's me. 
And it was really mind-blowing to me. I, I couldn't believe it. It was a, a big aha moment. And he went on to say that trans people in Vermont were largely traveling out of state for care, that they were going to Dartmouth and farther. There were a few people getting local care from endocrine, but by and large, there was no local care. And at that time in 2004, there was really some robust care going on for transgender people throughout the rest of the country, mostly in large urban centers. Oops. So it was really the intersection of the trans civil rights movement of the 70s. And I don't know if anybody is familiar with this history, but we have Sylvia Rivera and Barbara Johnson, two very well-known trans activists in New York City. The intersection of this civil rights movement and the advent of HIV and AIDS in the 80s that really transformed uh, care for transgender people. And it was really the work together of health providers at big LGBTQ health centers, as well as trans activists that started to create spaces for people to get care. They set up clinics for treating people with HIV and AIDS, trans people, primary care, and also, really importantly, a safe, medically supervised place to do hormonal transition. And some of those centers that started, of course, are still doing that work today. There's Tom Waddell in San Francisco and Kaylin Lord in New York City. Some of you may have heard of these places, the Fenway in Boston. And in 2004, when I started this work, there was much care happening in big cities, but not much care happening throughout the rest of the United States, particularly in rural areas. So at that moment in time, my career took a pretty dramatic an unexpected turn, and I was really able to be a part of this movement of providing trans care um, and expanding it in a much bigger geographical area. So in order to have clear communication today, I just want us to share the language and to have um, common language. So meet, maybe some people have seen this, the gender-bred person. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this. I really like this. There's lots of versions of it. I'm going to start down at the bottom with sex. Can people hear that? Am I, am I doing all right? Good. Um, and so sex. Sex is, re is your anatomy, your chromosomal makeup, what parts you have. OK? And it's also how you're assigned, your sex at birth. And how does that happen? the doctor, the nurse, the midwife, you know, somebody says, what do I, what do I, what do I have? If, if, you know, pre-world of ultrasound, you have a girl, you have a boy, and, and that is how you are assigned your sex at birth. We also have gender identity, and that is really an innate sense of one's gender that might or might not align with your biologic sex or the sex assigned at birth. You also have gender expression, and that is how you dress and um, your mannerisms and the way the world sees you. And then finally and importantly, we have um, sexual identity, which is, it's important to state often has virtually nothing to do with gender identity, very different. And those are the people that you are attracted to, either you know, connected to sexually or romantically. And trans is a pretty broad word. It's a good kind of umbrella inclusive word. The language of gender identity and sexual identity has really exploded and it's fast paced moving. There's always a new word. It can be really confusing. I'm going to try to use just a few words tonight and keep it simple, but I'll define them so we're all on the same page. The first is transgender, and that is when a person's uh, gender identity is not aligned with uh, their sex assigned at birth. So for example, a trans man was assigned as a female at birth, identified as female by anatomy, <clears throat> but their gender identity is that of a man. And conversely, a trans woman is male assigned at birth, and gender identity is that of a woman. 
I also want to talk about a concept, maybe not new to you, but new to my generation and generation of providers, which is the concept of the non-binary. We live in a really binary world. Right? You're either a male or a female. We know that children at three and four are already saying, that's a girl and that's a boy. But there are many people whose experience of their gender is somewhere in the middle. And when I first started doing this work, I had absolutely no concept of this whatsoever. And my interpretation, if someone said, I'm a trans man, but I like to dress up and sometimes I wear makeup, my interpretation of that was they're ambivalent, they're equivocal, they're not really sure. Maybe they need more time to figure it out with their therapist. And I was really doing them a disservice because I did not understand what this meant. And I've come to hear in listening to patients for many years that this is where a lot of people live. So I liked, I liked this uh, placard. And I hope as you're listening right now, you can also sort of reflect on what your own fixed ideas of gender are. And um, maybe they'll shift. Everything is a cl two clicks, sorry. So we know that nationally there's a lot more visibility and in some places acceptance of transgender people. There's a lot of more transgender celebrities and they've brought a lot of awareness to our, to our culture. This is Andrea Jenkins, she is the first um, African-American transgender woman elected to public office. She is a councilwoman for the city of Minneapolis. Ooh, sorry. It's, all right, that was worth waiting for it because this is Caitlyn Jenner, right? Sports figure, reality. TV star, but really has brought a lot of uh, people, particular older transgender women that I meet, out, so to speak, out of the closet. Her very public transition has been meaningful to a lot of people. This is Aidan Dowling. He is an activist and, um, and I think he's also, yeah, an activist and model. And this is our own Christine Hallquist, right, running for governor of Vermont. But we know while there are many high profile transgender people, the majority of transgender people are struggling. And we know that there is really tremendous disparity for them in our country. Okay. So in 2015, the, there was a US transgender survey. It was 27,000 respondents. They were surveyed from all over the country, transgender men and women from all 50 states. And this survey really points to the great disparity in income, in employment, in housing, um, and access to health care for transgender people. There we go. I mean, there we go. Okay, thanks. Um, they broke it down by state, so there are representatives, they have reports from each state, and they also broke it down by race and ethnicity. And here are some of the findings. And one, you know, they're pretty startling, some of them. Almost 30% living in poverty, 30% experiencing job loss or difficulty with employers, harassment. This statistic um, is really startling, and it is not a new statistic, the f that 40% of transgender people um, have made a suicide attempt um, or experienced suicidal ideation. And of course, not surprisingly, trans people of color consistently reporting significantly higher negative economic safety and health, health outcomes compared to white Peers. So what do we know? We know this is a really high risk group of, of people. And here were some, as, some of the findings for health disparities. A third, a negative experience with a health care provider. Almost a third, not seeking care because of an anticipated negative experience. And a third, not seeking care due to costs. So if we want to think about these disparities, how can we break down these barriers? How can we help 
transgender people, men and women, access care. So one large institutional barrier to care is lack of insurance. Thanks, Tiffany. And in 2012, a UVM transgender nurse decided to pursue a gender-related surgery. He, want, he wanted to do a, a surgery to further his transition. And his insurance company denied him, and they said this procedure is not covered by our insurance. We don't cover transition-related surgeries. And he was mad, and he um, was a very strong advocate for himself, and he approached the nurses' union, and together they began strategizing over the coming months about how to get his care covered. And in that strategizing, they also engaged with other members of the community that were working on trans access issues. And they thought, well, we're not just going to work on his surgery. We're going to work on having this coverage for everybody in our state. And nationally, at the same time, the same work was happening. So they partnered with national LGBTQ legal organizations and allies in state government. And in 2013, this insurance bulletin was published, and, and it stated that there could be no exclusion. All, all transition-related care was, had mandated coverage. You could not exclude procedures, hormone treatment, if you were an insurer in Vermont. And it was actually really, really um, well done, because it wasn't new legislation that needed to be passed, which would have taken forever and was very daunting, but it was using older anti-discrimination legislation um, to say that this coverage should be mandated. So those are, that's an institutional barrier, but what about just the barriers in communication with medical providers and transgender patients? And when I speak about medical providers, I'm really trying to keep it broad. I'm talking about nurses and x-ray techs and people at the front desk as well as, as physicians. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jody. Jody is a transgender woman that I've known for many years. And when she first started her transition, we were following her blood work for the first couple of months to adjust and titrate her hormone levels, which is pretty routine. And we noticed that her white blood cell count was climbing pretty rapidly. And it turned out after further evaluation that she had CLL, which was chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And even though she was healthy and well, she still needed to establish care with oncology. So she made an appointment to see a local oncologist. And Jody is a socially transitioned woman. She had been transitioned on hormones, but she was really presented as a woman and felt very strongly about presenting as a woman and being seen as a woman. And she went to this office and she said to the woman at the front desk, <clears throat> my, my legal name is John, but I'd like to be called Jody, which I actually thought took a lot of guts. And the woman at the front desk said, I'm, I'm sorry, we can't do that. Um, if you would like to be called by a different name, you'll have to speak to someone in the billing office. And I saw Jody a couple of weeks later and she said, I'm never going back there, which is, you know, concerning when somebody has a cancer diagnosis and, and needs to find local care. So, you know, someone might say, what is the big deal? It's just a name. But if you think about what that might have been like, a woman dressed as a woman, presenting as a woman, sitting in a waiting room full of people, a medical assistant comes out and says, John, and Jody stands. That might be really, really quite humiliating. So it's really unclear, you know, what it was happening in the mind of this receptionist. You know, did she have a personal dislike of trans people? Was she uncomfortable? Was she simply following rules? But in that moment, she really created a great divide and created a sense of distrust for, for Jody in engaging with the system.
So sometimes it's not so such an overtly negative experience. It's more subtle in communicating with trans patients. It's really sometimes just not knowing and being uncomfortable, a provider being uncomfortable to ask questions. I think that happens a lot. In my experience in Vermont, at least locally in our community, is that providers really want to do provide good care, but sometimes it's about not knowing what to ask. So I'll tell you about Alex. Alex is a young trans man. He's transitioned with testosterone. He's changed all his gender markers, his passport, his birth certificate, his health insurance says M, his driver's license. He presents fully as a man. And he went to a, or, a local urgent care with abdominal pain and some mild urinary symptoms. And he was diagnosed with a UTI and he was sent back with home with antibiotics, which he took. And I saw him three or four days later. We had already had an appointment, and I just went through the visit with him to see what had happened and how, you know, what, what the story was. And I noticed that he had been treated f with, for, with 14 days of a broad spectrum antibiotics. So typically, if you are a female assigned at birth, you are treated for an uncomplicated UTI with three days of antibiotics, with usually a narrow spectrum antibiotic. If you are male, excuse me, if you are a male assigned at birth, you are often considered to have had a complicated UTI and you are treated for 14 days with a broad spectrum antibiotic. So I asked Alex about what happened and what that interaction was like and he said, I told him I was a trans man, but I'm not really sure he understood what that meant. And so, you know, nothing terrible happened. You know, he was treated for longer than he should have, right? He might have gotten an antibiotic-associated diarrhea. He might have increased his risk of resistance using a broad spectrum, but it wasn't terrible. But I thought about it a lot over the next couple of days. It could have been terrible. Usually when a female assigned at birth or somebody that we identify as female comes into an urgent care or any setting with abdominal pain and urinary symptoms, we do a pregnancy test. And what if Alex had been pregnant? And what if Alex had had an ectopic pregnancy? Nobody would have known. And that really could have been catastrophic. So one question is, what's Alex's responsibility in this interaction? What should Alex have said? And so I think that's a question a lot of providers ask, and I think it's a, real, re, a really reasonable one. What is the responsibility of a patient to clarify their anatomy and, and tell people about their bodies for best care? And I think one of the main reasons that transgender people don't disclose information about their bodies is because of previous negative interactions with healthcare. It's sort of a, it can be a vicious cycle. It feels like information that might um, cause um, them to be rejected or treated poorly. I have a friend, a trans man, who told me once when he told his doc, this his new doctor that he was a trans man, she rolled her chair away from him. I mean, that's pretty subtle, but you know, so, so are in a lot of our communications with patients, and he f experienced it really as a, as a rejection. The other reason that trans men, and I'm gonna just go back one second to that slide. The other reason why um, in this situation uh, he might not have disclosed is often there is an externalized shame about body parts body parts that you might wish you didn't have, but, but we need to be able to take good care of. Um, so that is, an, this, this is a terrific um, image that I really like because one of the ways that we're addressing this in primary care is to really say, if the part's there, screen it. Even if you wish it wasn't there, even if you don't like it, it's there and we need to take good care of it. And this slide really is transaffirmative, it represents how a man might feel, and it encourages them in transaffirmative language to get a pap. I have a follow-up Alex story that I, that I just heard, and it's kind of a do-over. Uh, a man went to an urgent care in Rutland. He's a trans man, and he got there, and he knew he had a urinary tract infection. And he said to the PA, <clears throat> oh, by the way, th I'm a trans man. 
and he said she didn't miss a beat. She said, okay. When somebody has a short urethra, we treat them with a few days of antibiotics, and when they have a long urethra, they get treated for longer. And so that was terrific. That was a great interaction. He said, by the way, you know, and told her about himself. And she responded appropriately. She used transaffirmative language. She didn't feminize his body. She just explained how to give best care. So one way to keep conversation open and be able to talk to patients is to try to assume nothing when we, when we talk to them. And I assume things all the time. So this is really an aspiration, not a, a current reality. And in, in fact, in medicine, we're taught to make assumptions, make quick decisions. One of the first patients I ever had at the health center was a young woman who came in for a gynecologic exam, a pap smear. And during our pre-exam conversation, I asked her if she was sexually active, and she said yes. And then I asked her if she used birth control, and she said no. And as I was formulating all the ways I would discuss the problems with that and the risks of that, there was this long pause, and she looked at me and she said, I'm gay. And I won't forget that either, because in that moment, I really disrupted or blew apart any therapeutic alliance. And I let this young woman know that there was only one way to be sexually active, and that was having sex with a man. And so I would <coughs> encourage everyone just to, that with the idea that if we assume nothing and we really remain open and, and, we, do, and we ask rather than tell. And hopefully, if we ask, patients will tell. And if we ask in an open way, patients will tell. So one thing that's pretty straightforward, what would you like to be called? How about, who did you bring with you today? I really like this one. And by the way, these are great for all patients. You don't have to be just use these for transgender patients. I particularly like this one. You know, somebody comes in and you say, is this your mother? And it's their wife, right? It's better not, it's better just to ask. I like this one. This one is the one Alex's provider might have asked. Is there anything about your body that I need to know to take care of you today? That's pretty open-ended. It leaves, it leaves people the opportunity to tell you about their anatomy. And then one that I like to use in my practice, um, which is not necessarily relevant to all the everybody's practice, but what do you call your body parts? And that is helpful for me, because I'm talking to trans people about sexual behavior, contraception, if it's appropriate. I'm talking to them about changes in function, and I want to use language that doesn't alienate them and makes them feel comfortable. So in medicine, not knowing is often equated with weakness. I think we feel like <clears throat> it, it, it shows that we don't know what we're doing, that we're not bright, that we're not working hard enough, that we're not determined. And I would say that appearing to know everything or trying to know everything is, is it's impossible. It's exhausting, and it doesn't promote good patient care. And when I started this work, in 2004, I really knew nothing, literally nothing. And it's with being trained by patients, hearing their stories, collaborating with other doctors. That's really how I've been able to develop this really rich part of my practice. So I really want to encourage you as future physicians to embrace not, not knowing. And I really, liked this, I really like this quote. It's um, a Buddhist quote. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. And in the expert's mind, there are few. All right. So if we want to understand the drive or the reasons why people transition, what drives their transitions, we have to understand what gender dysphoria means. And gender dysphoria is dysphoria from the Greek, difficult to bear, right? It's distress or discomfort with one's biological sex or assigned gender. And I have a video, if it will play. We're going to see. 
that really just allows you to hear some voices from trans people talking about their transition. And if it doesn't play, I grew up like this, so it's like, this is me. Transgender people are not a fad that started with Caitlyn Jenner. Before I would go to bed, I would pray, God, when I wake up, I want to be a girl. Please make me a girl. It didn't work <laughs> for, for at least another, you know, many, many years. I was living life as a lesbian and, and I just started to slowly realize that that was not me, that that was not me being 100% myself. That was only just a part of myself. When I was a teenager at the time, I would often like uh, wear my sister's clothes sometimes or my mom's clothes when no one was around. And later, like I started buying wigs and like experimenting with like what would it be like to present as a woman? Some of the biggest misunderstandings they have about being trans is like, you trying to be someone else. No, you, you're trying to be you. You're trying to be you to the fullest. Uh, you know, I felt very alone. I felt that, uh, you know, I felt that nobody was ever really gonna understand me, that if I did speak about it, that I was gonna be um, sent away to kind of a re-education camp. You know, they have those, uh, they have those available for a lot of, a lot of kids. I thought that the people that were closest in my life would be the most understanding, but they were not. It took my mom about six months to come to terms with it. And she started, she realized that she loved me regardless. I came out very, very slowly in the late eighties. And you know, the gay community was the gay community and sometimes the gay and lesbian community. And it was just like, you know, I was invisible. Now the knowledge is, is out there, you know? And the public, I, it seems as if transgender people get more respect, but in terms of day-to-day -day respect, it's not 100% fixed yet. Every day one of my transgender friends goes out, I'm nervous that they're not gonna make it home. Um, I'm nervous that, you know, when they go on a date, some guy is gonna get upset that they're transgender and hurt them. I think a lot of people, when they think about trans people, they are still really holding on to some very base ideas about uh, sex and gender that they grew up with. We've got all of this stuff that's really kind of like embedded in our operating systems. Being trans is as varied as being a straight person. That's the biggest misconception that if you associate as being trans, that that's all you are. Like not all transgender people take hormones. Some of them do. Not all transgender people need surgery. Some of them do. Some of them are accepted. Some of them are not. So they're vast, complex stories. It just doesn't happen overnight. I haven't started taking anything yet. So before my voice deepened and I would walk into interviews and look like this and a girl voice would come out, I had to explain to everyone what transgender was so that they weren't looking at me like, what are you or who are you or you know, um, and I'm pretty sure I did not get a lot of jobs because of that. I really had gotten to a point where I thought that surgeries in particular were never gonna happen for me. My insurance company, uh, you know, finally came around to our way of thinking <laughs> and realized like we are gonna, we're gonna cover uh, trans, uh, trans healthcare, we're gonna tr cover surgeries. I'm on top of the world. I feel so lucky to have been able to, to, to get there and feel really at home in my body in a way that I never thought was gonna happen. Some of the greatest parts of being transgender and transitioning, going through that process are being called ma'am each and every day. It's more of like the world externally accepting me as a woman because I've realized I've been a woman the entire time. The best part about accepting and expressing my gender identity is that I don't think about that anymore. I just wake up and go about my day. At the end of it all, this has been an amazing experience and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I grew up like this, so it's like, this is me. 
transgender people are not Okay. So what are the different ways that people transition? There's a couple of different ways. One is social transition. You present the way you dress, the way the pronouns you use, your name. There's hormonal transition. That's a lot of the work that I do with patients. There's surgical transition, much more available now with improved insurance coverage for people. And there is absolutely no telling how somebody will proceed through their transition. It's very variable. There is no script or right way to do it. And I'm going to tell you about a patient, Richard. So this is a transgender woman who has chosen to not change his name or pronouns. And he ha has had a very private transition. There is no social transition. He's been using hormones on and off for about eight years. He is, I think, somewhat representative of people that I see that come from uh, rural places that are older. He is a 42-year-old um, transgender woman who uh, presents to the world his social or gender expression or social expression is that of a trans heterosexual male. He is married. He has four children under the age of 10. He is a police officer. He lives in a small rural Vermont town. He's very involved with his community. He coaches. His parents live nearby. And for him, he feels it would really be catastrophic to his family if he socially transitioned in his community. So that is not without great pain at times for him. Um, because he is always dealing with this desire to present as he feels he is. But he has continued to take hormones, and his body has continued to feminize. So what happens when, when people, trans men and women, use hormones? Well, feminizing hormones, um, really, that process of feminizing the body takes some time. It's much more of a marathon than a sprint. And typically, we use estrogen and, tes and testosterone blockers, most usually spironolactone. And there's breast development over a couple of years. Muscle mass decreases, skin changes, softening, hair growth slows. Hair does not disappear. So if transgender uh, women want to have hair removal, they they get laser or electrolysis. Um, there's a pretty significant change in sexual function, which for many people is great news, but not for everybody. So that's a conversation that we, that we have. There's also typically a loss of fertility. So talking about pre-transition fertility preservation is an important conversation to have if somebody wants to have biologic children. And then there are mood changes. Trans women often, especially at the beginning, talk about more expansive mood, more range of mood. And then there are masculinizing hormones. This happens much more faster, fast, quickly, excuse me. It's more of a sprint, really within 12 to 18 months. Voice deepening starts to happen at about four or five months. There's increased muscle mass, increased body hair and facial hair. There's the stopping of periods usually, especially if we titrate the dose up, and that's usually a goal of most trans men. There's clitoral enlargement, and then there's mood changes. One thing there isn't, however, if your partners, if you're a trans man and your partners are cis men, or male as men assigned at birth, then it, you cannot rely on testosterone as contraception. So it's a pretty important conversation to have, because a lot of trans men think if they're on testosterone and their periods have stopped, they're, they're all set for contraception. So who, who does transition? What, what, what is that range of, of ages, and, and how do people do it? So we know that children have t can be very gender fluid and really explore <coughs> their sense of gender. Well, there's even cultural acceptance to that in some ways. There's the tomboy, right? Plays sports, dresses like a boy. But there's usually an expectation that that will be, that that children will outgrow that as they, as they age. 
but there are children who continue as they move towards adolescence and begin pubertal change who feel a tremendous sense of dysphoria, right? There are, there are some children who they explore other gender expression, and then when it's time for them to go through puberty, they're, they're okay with it. They accept it. It doesn't cause them distress. But there are children for whom it causes tremendous distress. And so one option that we have now that's available is to just pause to press the pause button for puberty and let them continue to explore their gender expression. And then next slide. So one thing that's being used more and more, and it's used in our community as well, is puberty blockers. And why is that helpful? Well, it help, it's helpful because it delays puberty. And so again, it allows this time for kids to explore, usually often with <clears throat> mental health providers and their families. Um, how they're feeling, whether they want to stop and proceed through, through their natal puberty or actually to later on add masculinizing or feminizing hormones. They work their GNRH analogs, they work on the pituitary gland, and there's a lot of concern that they're unsafe for children, but actually they've been used many, for many decades for precocious puberty, so there's a lot of good sa safety data. And I think, you know, when you meet a 25-year-old transgender woman who's beginning her transition, she's 6'2", she has facial and body hair, she has a prominent jaw and forehead. This is someone who would have had great benefit of having never gone through puberty at all, right? It's much harder to transform as a woman after you've gone through male puberty. So there's really a place for these in care. But for the majority of young trans people, pubertal blockade isn't happening, um, and often they don't have access to it. And so we, there is a very large group of very distressed adolescents with pretty severe gender dysphoria, and we know they're a very high-risk group. They have a very high rate of suicidal ideation and attempt. They have much higher incidence of depression and anxiety, and um, they're really a group of kids we have to be paying attention to. We also know that advocating for these kids, providing support, particularly parental acceptance and support, makes a huge difference in how well they do. There's been some really, um, really good studies in the last few years that show us that, pediatrics um, being one of them. And I think that this slide says it all, how much better uh, trans teens do and, and young adults with um, parental support compared to those whose families reject them or do not accept the fact that they're trans teens. And so I see a number of teenagers and I meet with their families. And you know, these are typically families, if they show up, they're there. They're often, you know, most often really, they, they care about their kids. They want to do what's right, but they're, they're worried. They're worried, you know, what, what if this is just a fad? What if this is just kind of the flavor of the day, everybody's transitioning now? What if it's medically dangerous? What if they change their mind? So th they're all very reasonable questions. And then sitting in the same room as a kid who urgently wants to transition with hormones, 15, 16, 17. And there's often a real struggle going on between parents who love but are concerned and, and a kid who feels urgently that they need to transition. And I think one way of looking at it, knowing how high risk these kids are, is that perhaps the benefit outweighs the risk, in that not transitioning makes them at much higher risk for self-harming um, and worsening of mood and anxiety. And really, the answer to parents is we don't know. We don't know if they'll change their mind. My experience with people over time is very few do, but they might. So we talk about what's reversible and irreversible. We talk about that this is really a very, very safe thing to do, and there are things that we need to think about in advance. So I'll tell you a little bit about Jacob. Jacob was and is a um, transgender young man that I met when he was in his teens. He was struggling really um, pretty significantly with anxiety and depression. He was often suicidal. And he had been, 
in an ongoing struggle with his psychiatrist and his parents for the past year because he was very eager to transition. And they were very worried about his suicidality and his mood and the, as was his psychiatrist. Again, these were adults that really cared about him and basically said, when you are stable, when you are better, then you can transition. And he said, I will not, I will not be better until I can transition. And so Jacob ended up at the Brattleboro Retreat, which is um, a uh, psychiatric hospital in southern Vermont, when he was feeling suicidal. And he had a terrific psychiatrist there. And we started him on testosterone inpatient. So that was actually a nice, supervised, stable setting for he was going to be there for a few weeks to really see how he responded. And I think it's been about six or seven years. He's a young adult. He lives um, outside of Chittenden County. And he's doing pretty well. He lives with his parents. He's working. He's taking uh, college classes. And he still struggles with an anxi anxiety and depression because even though his gender dysphoria is greatly reduced, he's a person who has anxiety and depression. And people with mental illness can also be transgender and should also be able to transition. We just have to do it in a safe way. We usually just have a good team of providers psychiatrists, therapists, people that work um, with prescribers to just make it safe. And I just want to tell you about Donna because it's a feel-good story and she represents just the other end of the age spectrum. And you know, say what you want about Caitlyn Jenner, but Caitlyn Jenner helped Donna get to my office. She came and she said, if she can do it, I can do it. She's in her early 70s. She's a retired business executive. And she has some medical, chronic medical issues. She has coronary artery disease. She has cancer. She's in remission. And she really wanted to transition. And she has. And she's made some decisions based on her other health issues to minimize some of the things that she does. But she is thrilled at her, at her transition. And it's, it's been a terrific experience for her. So we're going to come back to Vermont. What's happening in Vermont? Well, these are, this was the Vermont results from that transgender survey I told you about before. It's a, it's a relatively small number of respondents. And a lot of the results, which I'm, I didn't put on the screen, mirror what's happening elsewhere in the country. But there were a few things that I thought were standouts. <clears throat> One was. Um, the lower rate of workplace discrimination. I'm not sure, you know, again, with a, a, a low number of respondents, you know, that we can really generalize. I certainly hear a lot of stories about people struggling in their workplace, but I thought this was good news, and it was certainly a much lower percentage than the national average. It was a much, much higher um, than the national average uh, amount uh, for living in poverty. And I, when I thought about that statistic, I wondered if it's because a lot of our trans community are young adults in their 20s and 30s, probably your age. Many of them have been um, alienated from their families and don't have any financial support from them. They're not yet established in careers or haven't gone to college because of some barriers associated with being, being transgender. So they are really. Um, a group that's struggling financially. And then I was sorry to see the almost one-third negative experience with health care providers. So we know that Burlington is a kind of Shangri-La for transgender people. It's a pretty great place to be. And actually, young people from all over the country end up coming here to live and work because they feel pretty accepted. So this is our pride parade from this fall. It was a beautiful day. Here's your UVM group. Somebody's very cute dog. I just wanted to <laughs> include that. But what's happening outside of Burlington? Because this is really a bubble, right? This is the Burlington bubble. What is happening in other parts of the state? How are transgender people getting care? And how are we addressing their unique issues? And one of the biggest issues for transgender people in rural states is social isolation. Some people talk about really, really supportive families. 
um, and communities, but that is certainly not the experience of all. And these are two really outstanding organizations in our state that have really been addressing that issue of social isolation. And one is Pride Center of Vermont, based in Burlington. They have a wonderful mentee mentorship program for rural Vermonters where they get can connect through social media and by phone call and just get support that way. They also, of course, have lots of local programming. And then there's Outright Vermont, which is another terrific organization for youth. They do drop-ins and social evenings and parent support groups. And they're also developing programs throughout the state, educated, traveling to educate students in schools, offering support, and just really trying to replicate what they do here throughout the state of Vermont. So I just want to talk a little bit about what we do at the Community Health Center. This is the Community Health Centers of Burlington, where I work. It's a federally qualified health center. We have a transgender clinic that we started in 2010. It's two mornings a week. And in 2000, and over the last year, we saw about 412 transgender patients through all our sites. We also have primary care. We have uh, patients take advantage of our behavioral health program. And a lot of what I do with patients is gender transition with hormones. But I am by no means the only person providing this care. Um, at all, there's been this really tremendous and ongoing movement of providing care throughout the state of Vermont. We have outstanding trans affirmative therapists who are often the first point of care for transgender people accessing health care. We have wonderful surgeons, Dr. Kim Boyman, Dr. Jillian Stern, who's urology at UVM, Dr. Kevin McGuire, who's plastic, does plastic surgery here. Hopefully you guys will interface with them. We have speech and language therapists that work on voice therapy. And we also have more and more people doing hormonal transition um, in their own primary care settings. So Planned Parenthood has made a huge different for, difference for rural Vermonters. People who would come to see me from southern, southern Vermont um, or the Northeast Kingdom now can go to local Planned Parenthoods. College Health, UVM is prescribing hormones now. and then wonderfully and really importantly more and more primary care doctors and PAs and NPs are doing this care in their offices because that's really ideal care to really just be able to go to your primary care doctor and say I want to transition and can you help me and that is really the goal of um, us in trying to get more and more trans affirmative care in our state all right That is it. All right. Does anybody have any questions before you hit the road? Yes. So I'm just talking about Vermont, local Vermont Medicaid. So good question. That question was, does Vermont Medicaid cover trans services? And actually, Vermont Medicaid, um, for even way before um, private insurers um, were covering care, Vermont Medicaid has been covering care. So there are some restrictions. They cover hormones. They cover office visits. They cover behavioral health visits. What they haven't covered and what's been the most challenging and is really being worked on pretty aggressively right now is access to surgical care care. That's been the struggle. But otherwise, um, it's been pretty, pretty good coverage. Good question. So how do we help families be less transphobic and more accepting? I think it's a lot of it is ongoing conversations and meeting with families over time. And sometimes I see a family and we meet and then 
we have a plan to come back and they'll bring another family member with them or two months will go by, nothing, four months, they're back. So there's this open-ended and there's really, a, I spend a lot of time connecting people to resources because I'm just one little being in one place, but we take advantage of local resources. There's a great parental support group, um, hooking them up with resources and other parents who are struggling with the same. Yes. So I guess tonight is one way of educating eventual providers around transferable care, but do you engage in other types of workshops or whatever in terms to educate other providers who are already training? I do. We, part of um, what I do, and I work with a um, terrific NP at the Community Health Center who runs um, our LGBTQ clinic, Leo Klein, and we have gone pretty over the years together to do staff trainings for different, if we're asked, right? Different, um, diff we've been to rheumatology and ID at UVM. Um, and, you know, somebody asks, we travel college health. So a lot of discussion around how practices can be more trans-affirmative. So when you're working with a child as well, um, I know a little bit about what they do in places like uh, Missouri. So I read like a tutorial by Paul Cruz about what they do for children who are going through or are having thoughts about changing gender and they get psychiatric. Sure, so most um, children who want to start puberty blockers um, that are getting local care, they see, um, they come to UVM, there's actually a, a clinic dedicated to children, it has a very strong behavioral health component, they meet with families, it's really a team approach. They meet now, it's Erica Gibson, she's an adolescent medicine specialist, is the physician, and then there's a dedicated social worker and um, other available consultation. Can you talk about your path to specialize in this? Like you had that aha moment, and then where did you go for further education to make this your career? Yeah, very good question. So the question is how how did it start for me? I did, I, I kind of missed that piece a little bit. So I actually was trained by this wonderful trans educator who said, anybody interested, come step up, and, and he trained me. He hooked me up with physicians around the United States that was, was, were providing this care. I visited, there weren't, at that moment in time, there weren't conferences, there weren't, you know, um, as, as much as ha is happening now. So I will say I was self-trained, but really I was trained by the community and people that were already doing this care. And at that point, you were a family, family physician. still is, right. And Yes. And I think that's the point about this is that a lot hormone therapy and this care is really, really belongs in primary care, that it doesn't need to happen in a specialist office with endocrinology. It's pretty straightforward medicine. And there are protocols that have been published that I used by all these LGBTQ health centers. Um, and it, it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's not rocket science. Yes, there's something called WPATH, which is the world's professional organization, and they, um, you know, that that I didn't I didn't do that whole historical piece, but that has been in process, so that there are stand what they have what are called the standards of care, so everybody's not just making it up as they go along. Yes. If a patient comes in and comes out to you as transgender, when would it be appropriate to change their sex or gender? In terms of changing gender markers? That's a, that's a very good question. The question is changing gender markers. And um, that really is usually patient driven. I have, um, and, and it's, it's again, I, as soon as somebody asks me to write, we, they need letters for certain things. They don't, you don't need letters to change your name, right? You can change your name to anything you want. But off in our state, you need a letter for the DMV. Um, federally, you need a letter for passports. Um, in Vermont, you need a letter of support um, for um, changing your birth certificate. So as soon as somebody asks, 
I am happy to write them a letter because it really furthers their social transition. And I think as people transition, it's unsafe. You know, that sort of non-alignment of how you present and what your um, gender markers are become an issue where that you know, or people can harass around or um, humiliate or shame around. So I think it's important to do. What about in the medical records? So, for instance, when I was prescribing for a doctor. I was looking on the schedule and it said, oh, we're about to see this young woman, and you walk in, and the young woman is not sitting right. So these are, these are the big ongoing EHR obstacles, and it's very confusing. And so what we do a lot at the health center, which is a small, easy to do it place, are workarounds. You know, we, people write in. I know that UVM has been working on this for a long time, and Somebody might have more updated information than I. But it's sort of ways to work around. We immediately scratch out that MRF. We write the correct one in. We write preferred names in. We write pronouns in. So when I walk into a room, I know exactly. And we ask people right when they come in. It's part of the brain. We know our system isn't going to help us, so we just work around it. Uh, this one be kind of a new question, um, but I, I was curious. So we heard a lot of testimonies about people that really felt strongly about the machine and things like that. And uh, some of the, uh, I think you could say like criticism or, or counter argument. I don't even know if there's valid arguments or not, but some of the, the uh, objectors would say like, what if someone changes their mind or something like that? I was curious if, if there's any, is there any reason to that? Have you ever come across anyone that has kind of <coughs> kids, uh, kids that do change their mind from one thing to another, or you know that? So I'll just speak to it. Um, in my experience that there are there there are. I mean, mostly by the time people come to see me, and this is really goes to the parental concern that you know somebody just is rolling with the tide and wants to be part of a big social movement. Mostly by the time people get to me, they're struggling with dysphoria. If they've made an appointment and sh show and come through the door. What then they choose to do with it is different. And some people really often in that sort of non-binary spectrum, they just need to try. And usually the people that are going to stop, stop pretty quickly. Um, it, it's a very small number, but it absolutely happens. It's, uh, you know, I can think of a, a young trans man and he identifies as non-binary, transmasculine, but he said four months in, you know, I don't, um, this isn't what I need to do. Fine. As long as you know, there's a consent process of what is reversible and what is irreversible, and, and to know that really clearly. And occasionally, someone will say, uh, this is less often a trans man, I just want my voice to deepen. I don't care about anything else. So stays on testosterone for a year, um, and, then, and then stops, and has a permanently, that's an irreversible change, deep voice. But there are people, for, mostly for social reasons, because of their families or partners, will start and stop um, while they are sort of figuring it out. Um, are there any things that require you to um, refer your patients to patient to providers outside of the states? Or are there things that Vermont could be doing better or specialists that we could be bringing to the state to improve and sort of create more robust care for the transgender population? Well, absolutely. And really, the biggest local need is surgical care, more um, comprehensive sur surgical care. And that's something that, that really um, would, would make a difference for people if they could have um, Basic, the biggest one really is gender confirmation surgery, but that you know there are very few um, doctors really throughout the world that do those surgeries, and it's one of those surgeries that you you want that doctor, that surgeon to have done a lot of them. It is a very complicated surgery, so you know it's not like taking out someone's gallbladder. No offense to any of the general surgeons, <laughs> it is. It's really something that you you know it requires an enormous amount of expertise, and because it's it's a really interesting um, struggle right now that there are you know um, so much more access. People are saying my insurance will now cover this surgery, but there's just a handful of people that do it really well. So I think you know that's something that the urologic and um, plastic surgeons hopefully will figure out. But we have terrific local surgeons. Um, Kevin McGuire does lots of top surgery. That's the removal of breast tissue for trans men. 
um, and he gets people in pretty quickly. People go to Dartmouth. Jillian Stern, urology, does orchiectomy for trans women. So she doesn't do reconstructive surgery, but she at least gets people going. And Dr. Kim Boyman does hysterectomy for trans men. So they're terrific. It's just, it would be great to have more. And I think that's, um, but that's really true all over the United States. Where do you intend to refer people to? Like what states are these providers? So people, patients usually find find their surgeons on their own. They do a lot of research and networking, and I, you know, I can provide names. But, um, you know, I, I really, the, when we're talking about costs, because often I have a very large Medicaid um, group of patients, we're talking about people who can't, you know, fly out to the West Coast and spend three or four weeks there. So now uh, Sinai in New York City, NYU, Boston Medical Center are now, which is really terrific, regional medical centers now that are offering this care. All right, okay. Thank you, um, anybody else? Michael, I think we have one last, yep. maybe one last question. Hopefully you're not an angry general surgeon who I just defended. <laughs> so, um, I don't know who, um, what age range would come into your clinic, but if a child came into your clinic and was concerned about gender transition, but because it's a child, Right, that's a very good question. Do you need parental consent? So I start um, prescribing hormones at about 15. And the children that I see in my practice that I see for primary care that are gender fluid or exploring when they are ready for puberty blockers, I send them to um, the, the clinic at UVM. But in terms of being able to transition without parental consent, that that is tricky because you do need under, at, at, after 18 it is just an informed consent process. And back in the olden days when I started, you needed letters from therapists to um, approve of you moving forward. And now it's really an informed consent model. But if you're a teen, you need, I don't require, um, uh, if there are two parents, both, but it re does require parental consent. So, working with a patient such as this, how would you be able to tell if they were being abused at home, or, or would you do suspicion? I only ask because, again, this relates to the law. You mean in, in terms of being a like, trans teen who is being... The father of my car beat her right and say at home, uh, was constantly <coughs> I mean, I, I guess that was a question about patterns of abuse. I, I, I mean, in my transgender practice, I, I wouldn't say that I, you know, have seen that um, in any greater degree than I would in, in, in my primary care setting, which, has, which is rare. And um, part of our screening process is to have everybody speak to, we have a behavioral health specialist at our clinic, so everybody, so we're really getting a sense of family structure and wellness. And of course, most teens that I see come with their parents. And if their parent is supportive, um, you know, they come. Parents that are angry and um, oppositional don't typically come. But I certainly meet transitional age teens who are being uh, really struggling with their parents at home. Yes? Um, for trans youth who haven't played long for puberty, they may start hormone blockers to delay that and feel more Sure, that's a really good question. So, you know, eventually you have to make a move because the other thing that's happening is your same age peers are going through puberty and you're not. So, you know, that's that's that becomes also an issue for kids. So, I think usually, um, it, you know, kids move into their early teens and then working with a behavioral health team, making that decision about am I stopping and proceed with my usual natal puberty, in which case everything 
happens normally. And we, again, we know that from the decades of use for, for these me medications for precocious puberty. Um, and if we otherwise we add um, on, and that's what I d sometimes do in my practice when I use puberty bo blockers, is that they're already on them, and then we add feminizing or masculinizing hormones, and then we actually get to use less of those, which is better because we're suppressing um, what the uh, natal hormones are doing. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of things. Um, one is, I, I, you know, for those of you who want to get better with this, I would encourage you um, to think about two things. The, the best way to get comfortable talking with and working with any population is to hang out with people who represent that population. And while we all learn stuff from our patients, don't depend on or ask your patients to teach you, please. It's a burden that's too great to put on them. And so when I, as, as a gay man in the Student Health Center, my colleagues started sending me all the trans patients, thinking that that meant all the trans students, that I would be able to do it. And guess what? I started making mistakes. And um, I talked to one of my colleagues who said, well, you should go to this WPATH conference. And I went, and it ended up that a lot of the presenters were trans-identified people. And I had this great several days of hanging out with all these colleagues of mine, a number of mental health workers, and, um, and not all the people there w were trans-identified, but learned all this great data about how powerful the treatment was, and just talking to people and getting myself comfortable and finding out like why um, affirming treatment was so effective, and, and, just, and it just was um, incredible momentum for me to go back and be able to do this work much more comfortably. And I continue to learn every time I have an encounter, but it, it really was um, a bad idea for me to expect to be naive and, and not that great at it and try to learn each time. Um, so, you know, you, you will have colleagues, you'll have the opportunity for um, professional development, so take advantage of that. I would encourage you if you're going to do this work. Um, there is one upcoming um, opportunity. Um, UVM has a terrific conference every year that's put on a main campus called the um, Translating Identity Conference. It's November 3rd. Um, it happens in the, in the Davis Center, and I'll make sure that there's information posted around the campus, probably um, in your weekly wire, and maybe we'll find out other ways to, um, I'll talk with the GSA members um, uh, to do that. So uh, I know um, I, I took a picture or two and uh, texted them off to Dr. Mbassiani in uh, California um, where he's working today, and uh, I know he'd be uh, pleased to have everybody here. Um, so thank you for your attendance, um, and let's uh, thank Dr. Inker again for a wonderful time. <laughs>